Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of the Savior. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. Give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen Church of God's Love. My name is Vicar Brandy, and today we celebrate the third Sunday after Epiphany. A couple of announcements about our life in the church. Uh, you still have time, if you haven't had a chance, uh, to participate in the last few days of our 21-day racial equity challenge. As well, we really encourage you to take a look at the possibility of registering for our uh, racial uh, justice and implicit bias training that will be happening, uh, specifically being hosted here for the Congregation of God's Love by Not in Our Town, Princeton. So uh, make sure that you uh, check out the messenger for additional information on that, as well as other opportunities uh, for education uh, moving into the winter season. The other thing I would like to make sure that I remind you is that our congregational meeting will be coming up on January 31st. We encourage everyone to attend. It will be online, and you will be receiving information shortly uh, that will help you prepare for that uh, participation and event in the life of the congregation. So let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Show you my 
winter morning to dance in. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Jonah chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our youngest disciples that are worshiping with us today online. We have a wonderful little children's sermon today based on the story of Jonah and the big fish. And you may have just been listening to it because it's also the first lesson for our liturgy today. But we're going to read it out of our Sparks Bible. Jonah and the Big Fish. One day, when Jonah was just minding his own business, God spoke to him. God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell the people that I know they aren't living the way I want. I want them to change their ways. Well, Jonah may have started with the right idea, but once he started walking, Jonah began thinking about what a long walk it was to Nineveh and how mean those people in Nineveh were. Hmm, Jonah thought, well, I don't really want to go to Nineveh. I'll go the other way. God will never know. So Jonah walked and walked away from Nineveh. When Jonah got to the sea, he paid to get into a boat to take him even farther away. Ooh, Jonah yawned. All that walking made me tired. I'm going to take a nap on the boat. Jonah curled up on a pile of rope and fell asleep. But God saw Jonah. Whoosh! God sent a strong wind that tossed the ship to and fro. The sailors were so afraid that they started just throwing things overboard, 
to make the boat lighter and to save themselves. The sailors were worried. What's going on? They woke Jonah up. God is mad at me for not listening, Jonah said. So throw me overboard. And they did. Suddenly, the sea was calm again. Look out, Jonah. Here comes a big fish. Go! The fish swallowed Jonah, and Jonah sat inside the dark, smelly fish for three days and three nights. Jonah prayed, Help me, God. I'm really sorry. Finally, the fish spit Jonah out on the beach. Trudge, 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 Jonah went to Nineveh. He told the people what God had said, and they believed him. And they changed the way they behaved. God was happy that the people of Nineveh were now living as God had wanted. So I'm curious, what do you think happened next? Do you think that Jonah was happy that God forgave the people of Nineveh? Well, it might come as a surprise, but Jonah was very unhappy that God forgave those people of Nineveh. In fact, he was really upset. He was upset because those people of Nineveh had been so mean. Jonah didn't want to forgive them himself. That was why he ran so far away from Nineveh and got on the boat. He was scared of the people of Nineveh. He didn't trust God, and he didn't want to forgive the people of Nineveh. Let's think about that. Jonah wanted those mean people of Nineveh to pay for their unkindness. Wouldn't that be fair? Well, it may seem fair in our thinking, but that's not God's thinking. We all make mistakes. God gives us all an opportunity to say sorry when we make mistakes, and God forgives us. God never stops loving us. So the story of Jonah reminds us today that we all need forgiveness. And when we're living our lives in a godly way, we say sorry when we make mistakes, and we accept other people's apologies when they make mistakes. We forgive, and we learn to forgive abundantly like God. I hope you'll have a wonderful day today, and thank you for joining me for the children's sermon. Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God 
and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a bit farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anyone who holds the old stereotypical opinion that the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and judgmental in contrast to the God of the New Testament who is loving and merciful should carefully read the book of Jonah. So familiar are the details of this captivating story that a brief summary will set the scene for us. Jonah the prophet is commissioned by the Lord to go and preach a warning to Nineveh of its impending destruction. In this case, geography is theology. Because Nineveh was located 230 miles north of present-day Baghdad. Nineveh is the seat of the most evil empire marked by greed, grievance, and violence. The Lord calls upon Jonah to preach the word to this most evil empire. However, Jonah buys a ticket for a seat on a passenger boat that flees 2,000 miles in the opposite direction towards Spain. An act of God on the high seas threatens to destroy the boat and all aboard it. Phoenician sailors, ironically more deeply religious than Jonah, determine who is the culprit for this predicament and agonize over what to do about it. Despite the moral ambiguity posed by the circumstances and their reluctance to risk the loss of life, the Phoenician crew tosses Jonah overboard into the deep blue sea. Jonah becomes dinner for a large marine creature. He finds himself entombed in the big fish for three days and three nights. We've heard that time frame before. From the entrails of the fish, Jonah pontificates a prayer so full of pious platitudes that the poor sea creature vomits him up onto dry land. Our text begins with the Lord's refusal to give up on stubborn Jonah. The prophet of the Lord gets a second chance to go off to the most evil empire and preach the word. In the midst of the great city, Jonah unleashes a five-word sermon whose brevity is only matched by its lack of sensitivity to the proper distinction between law and gospel. Forty days and you're toast! And yet in spite of Jonah's terrible preaching, the response far exceeds that of any modern evangelistic crusades. 
The formerly evil people of the most evil empire believe in God and exhibit a change of heart so effective that a fast is proclaimed and all are clothed in sackcloth and sprinkled with ashes from the king all the way down to the cattle. The account in the original language implies that the animals have a more robust belief in God's mercy than Jonah does. God startles Jonah once again by calling off the whole judgment upon Nineveh. And the prophet is not pleased, not pleased at all. Jonah is still stuck in the syndrome. Our world, nation, and families continue to suffer from the Jonah syndrome. It is evident in a world where individuals cry out in prayer for mercy for themselves, but demand vindictive justice for everybody else. It is evident in a nation where loyal opposition turns into nasty partisanship. It is evident in our overpopulated prisons where rehabilitation is a curse word. The Jonah syndrome creeps into our church life when we place unreasonable demands upon folks without understanding the totality of all of their important commitments and challenges. It is evident in a marriage where one spouse demands and demands from the other without recognizing the need to balance demands with affirmation and kindness. Jonah, dear Jonah, don't you get it? Nineveh is not worthy of God's mercy and loving kindness. Iraq and Iran are not worthy of God's mercy and compassion. North Korea surely is not worthy of God's mercy. Lately, is America worthy of God's mercy? Who is? This is exactly why Jonah had fled from the Lord's call in the first place. He wanted to be the gauge of merited mercy. He wanted to be the broker. He wanted no part in the deliverance of a brutish and banal empire. By the end of this captivating narrative, Jonah continues to wrestle with the fact that God can be merciful upon whomever God chooses to be merciful. That's why God is God. Beloved of God, what is at stake in this gospel-centered story is the triumph of divine mercy. What is at stake here is the triumph of God's mercy for the individual so that the individual can commend that mercy to others, including one's worst enemies. What is at stake here is the triumph of God's mercy within the community of faith so that members of that fellowship can be sensitive to the timing of when to demand and when to commend, when to admonish and when to forgive. Give. What is at stake here is the triumph of God's mercy in our nation while being truthful about the hurt and pain that require mercy for ultimate healing and reconciliation. This does not mean that the role of law, judgment, and accountability are not important. What it does mean is that in our moral universe, God's mercy triumphs. God's mercy gets the last word. With Brother Jonah, the Spirit calls every single one of us to let that word sink in deep.
church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and musicians, that all may proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God may raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the well-being of our nation, for our President Joseph Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and their incoming administration. We plead to you, O God, for the peaceful transition of power and for the prevalence of reason and reconciliation throughout the land. Help us all to participate in wise decisions for our common life and serve our neighbors and local communities. Enable us to be at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcast and all who await relief, especially we lift up Calvin, Elena, Nancy, Kim, George, Joanne, Peggy, Ed, George, and those we name aloud or silently at this time. Have mercy, O oh God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, that God's steadfast love may serve as a model for all relationships, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they may point us to salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray together boldly. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your, your will be done, done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us take a moment now and share the peace of Christ with one another and please use your imagination. At this time, we also encourage you to remember your offering gifts to the church. You can always put those in the mail, drop them by the church to office during office hours, and you can make contributions online. Uh, we appreciate all your gifts, including those in kind, as we are still collecting food donations in the lobby for those in need. Let us pray. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms wide open. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen.
God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace.